Heirloom Hybrid GMO. We have all heard these terms before, but do we know what they mean? Field correspondent Nick Schmitz talks to some experts to find out what is in the seeds that we are growing. So Jay, I'm looking and I'm seeing a lot of different plants here. Yeah, this is kind of the benefit of heirlooms is the diversity of color, shape, sizes. You know, each one represents different cultures, different countries and, you know, different families. Tell me a little bit about your background. What is, what is your area of study? I'm a broadly trained molecular biologist, but my focus is genetics. And the project that I've worked on for many years now has to do with um, plant breeding for sustainable agriculture. So I'm not a plant breeder. I'm a molecular biologist who's worked with a lot of plant breeders. The seeds are one of those things that have been around for a long time. In the past, you would, if you cross two plants or two plants were crossed, you'd always select the best and, and stabilize that. Whereas now you just cross the two plants every generation for the first generation of seeds and plant that, and then the next generation you have to cross the two plants again. Generally, the goal of a plant breeder is to create a crop variety uh, that has characteristics that are valuable to the end user. That is, uh, farmer, gardener, whoever it is you're going to, you're anticipating will use the, the final product. And so it's a lot of time making uh, controlled crosses between different plant varieties to try to get the optimal set of traits. Matt, these processes that you're talking about, are these things that do naturally occur with plants crossing, but in a lab setting, you can sort of speed it up and you can sort of be more selective about what traits you're bringing to the table? Generally, yes. If we're not talking about genetically modified crops, which are a different thing, most plant breeders are making natural hybridizations. That is essentially doing what Mendel did taking one plant, taking another plant, making it pollinate on the other. Hybrid seeds are very common with vegetable breeding and many crops. Corn is sort of the biggest, most prominent example of where hybrid seed has just worked wonders in terms of creating new crop varieties. And that's basically what an F1 hybrid is. It's a cross between two different plants that might be a purple wild tomato and a small cherry tomato. But when you cross those two plants, you might have a productive, uh, high yielding, good shipping tomato, or whatever it is. And interestingly, what uh, often happens is the F1 hybrid, the first generation hybrid, will has a phenomenon that we call hybrid vigor and actually outperforms either of the parents in all categories. Why exactly that happens is a matter of debate uh, between scientists to this day. Uh, why genetically you get this, this uh, we call it heterosis, but the more common term is hybrid vigor. When you have this hybrid plant that has all of these characteristics that you're looking for, can you then harvest the seeds from that and plant another generation of that, of that same crop? The average person cannot, unless they want to go to a great deal of effort for uh, reasons that are genetically somewhat complicated, but uh, essentially most people learn in their, let's say, high school biology class, once you get past the F1 generation into what we call the F2 and beyond, because of chromosome behavior and DNA recombination, all of those traits that were a uniform exact match, you know, or, or uniform combination from the two parents in the F1, suddenly start to get all shuffled around into strange combinations in the F2 and beyond. What you can do if you have the time and effort, and this is what plant breeders do, is you can do selection. You know, in nature, natural selection starts to pick out the ones that are not particularly good, and then it gets refined, you know, till you get a good, you know, set of characteristics. Plant breeders don't wait for that and have different criteria than nature does. So we're picking out then from those later generations, the best possible set of traits. You can do that over several generations and even speeding it up in the greenhouse that usually takes several years. And then you can get a uniform uh, plant with all of the great characteristics that is then genetically stable, has sort of stabilized its genes uh, to all the desired characteristics. But that takes a lot of time and effort. And then you also have an inbred plant now, which is essentially what heirlooms are. <laughs> Heirloom plants are what people have done over generations, in some cases, centuries. They have selected and hey, they have created these uh, varieties that probably were hybrids at one time. Uh, and then over a long period of time, you know, had exactly the characteristics they wanted in a consistent way. Jerry, can you explain to me 
heirloom seeds. What does that mean? So it means different things to different people, but basically an heirloom seed is a non-hybrid, uh, non-patented variety that's been passed down from generation to generation. In the past, pretty much all seeds were heirloom seeds. That's what seeds were. It was a variety that you would have in your family or your community and it was passed down and from generation to generation. And as far as how old that is, that can mean different things to different people. A lot of people think it's 50 years or 100 years, but it's really just a seed overall that's been passed down. Traditionally, everybody kind of selected and developed their own strains, and each region had local regionalized varieties. And that's what makes heirloom seeds special. You can grow something that Thomas Jefferson grew or George Washington might have grew, or it might be from your Chinese ancestry or your German ancestry or wherever you came from, you can go, go back in your culture and find varieties that are part of your cultural heritage. Wherever you're at, there's stories and traditions and foods that have been passed down as well as the seeds that went with them. What are the advantages to an heirloom seed? Well, there's a, definitely a lot to consider and I, I, you know, it's not necessarily the perfect solution for every single gardener, but I would say most gardeners can find an heirloom seed that will do as well or better than hybrid varieties in their garden. The other advantage is a home gardener literally has, you know, thousands of choices. So there's all different advantages whether it's uh, you know the nutritional benefits, uh, we've did some different tests here on varieties, nutritional studies, and some of the varieties, even in say the same crop, you'd think it'd be all somewhat the same. Sometimes like, oh wow, like the vitamin A might be 10 times what it is in the next variety. So that's the other benefit. You have all these colors, which in general represent different minerals and nutrients. You also have the histories and stories that go along with them. And that's probably as important as anything, being able to have that traditional uh, part of your culture or part of other cultures and keeping it alive and the stories alive with it. And also the ability to save your own seed without any patenting or control with corporations or governments. It's just saving and passing down, you know, what humans have always done and, uh, you know, supplying your own table with stuff that you've grown and saved right from your own property. You know, that's kind of the benefit, you know. When I look around the, the grounds here at Baker Creek, I see a lot of large fields of all the same crop. Now, is that done on purpose to s cut down on sort of cross pollinization of seeds to sort of keep the seeds, I guess, pure is the word? It is, yeah. A lot of the t things we're raising here are for seed. So um, if it's something we are raising for seed, if we're just raising it for eating or uh, taking pictures, documenting, then we don't um, necessarily separate it. But if we're uh, uh, saving seed, we have to isolate it from the other crops. So some things have to be like melons, for example, have to be like a half a mile apart or so. So it depends on the crop. So each crop, we kind of either isolate it by space or even time, you know, when we plant it at different times. GMO. So we hear this phrase a lot, GMO, genetically modified organism. Can you explain to me what is different about a GMO versus a hybrid seed? Hybrid seeds are hybrids. They are natural hybridizations between plant varieties. This is all naturally occurring stuff. We're, we're gathering maybe plants from all over the world to find the best hybrid that we can create, but it's still natural hybridization. GMO is a completely different thing. With GMO, you are not obtaining, you're not getting the genetic information, the DNA into these plants by cross-pollinating them or any natural reproductive fertilization. You are taking, you are taking recombinant DNA in a test tube and you are fusing it together using molecular techniques, usually generating what we call a plasmid, which is a little engineered molecule, and you are then uh, using technology to insert it into the DNA, the genome, the chromosome of this plant. It's a seed that has been crossed artificially. Basically, it it's not really crossed. It had genes brought in from another species, another plant, another animal. It might be a gene to make the fruit a different color, but in more cases or not, it's uh, it has to do with pest resistance or pesticide resistance more often than not. So the farmer can spray whatever chemical it's been genetically modified to resist. You can spray it on the plant that would normally kill the plant. So now it has genes to resist glyphosate or whatever the chemical may be. And that way a farmer can spray basically almost, you know, unlimited amounts of chemicals, at least compared to what it used to be on this plant and the plant will survive. So that's the biggest, probably single advantage that farmers see is, you know, the ability to control pests and weeds. You can take 
genes from an octopus and put it into a corn plant. So we're talking about taking uh, gene sequences from completely different species that you could never get into these plants through any natural hybridization means, and you are inserting them into the genome and expressing them so that the plant now creates some product, usually a protein or an enzyme, uh, that it would never have been able to get in any other way. So that's genetic modification, completely foreign, what we call transgenes now introduced into, into the plant. And and what is the benefit? Why would you want to do that? There, there are a lot of reasons. Uh, disease resistance, pest resistance being prominent amongst them. Uh, you think like flavor saver tomatoes or one of the early ones that had to do with shelf life. The downside is, you know, all the other potential harmful effects the spraying can have. And also, you know, the one of the biggest issues is who owns the seed and who controls the seed. With, you know, with the heirloom seeds, it's owned by the consumer. It's kind of like open source software versus genetically engineered seeds and then patented seeds, which uh, most genetically engineered seeds are patented. The issue is who controls the seed, you know, long term. So uh, this has implications for what people can do, you know, uh, with those. And when you are purchasing hybrid seed uh, and always GMO seed, generally farmers, growers uh, have a, um, uh, a usage agreement that sort of dictates how they are to use this and what the, the limitations are on that. As a, a home gardener, if you're you're gonna plant your own your own produce, is there any concern that you would purchase GMO seeds? GMO seeds in, in the United States are not permitted for distribution to individuals uh, who are not growers. And when you're when you're a farmer, you have you know a status, you know, and sort of a registered, you know. So it is not possible for a home gardener to even to accidentally plant GMO seeds. It's uh, different things that have been passed down, different things that different people have developed in the past or selected out of the wild, and uh, keeping these varieties alive. You know, it's uh, like this little sunflower here I collected a few years ago in Thailand. This variety comes from Switzerland. Um, of course, cowpeas originally came from Africa, but now they come from multiple different locations. And it's just like a living history book almost, uh, telling the stories in a, a life, you know, in a live living plant of different cultures and food traditions. 